tonight. Aid in Ale. Gaza struggles with famine as aid deliveries continue to see obstructions in the region. Airdrops now seemingly becoming a saving grace to the affected. The Blame Game. Russian officials continue to accuse the West of pulling the strings behind the tragedy in Moscow, despite the Islamic State owning up to the massacre. Time for Truth. Trump's media company sees unprecedented success on its stock market debut. Truth Social continues to rise in popularity. And Feeling Helpers. Feeling low? Well, it's time for a pick-me-up with some animal friends. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for taking the time to join us on World News this Wednesday night. We're already almost halfway through this week as well and with time flying this fast we most certainly saw even more rapid developments on global stories we were following up on for you. Well, let's get right to it tonight's updates starting off with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Destruction, lawlessness and Israeli red tape are only some of the obstacles facing truck drivers trying to deliver aid into Gaza. These food-filled trucks have become the main lifeline for more than 2 million Palestinians living in the war-ravaged enclave. Destruction, lawlessness and Israeli red tape. These are some of the obstacles facing truck drivers trying to deliver aid into Gaza. These food filled trucks have become the main lifeline for more than 2 million Palestinians living in the war ravaged enclave. It is absolutely essential to have a massive supply of humanitarian aid now. More than five months into Israel's war with Hamas, a report by a global authority on food security has warned that famine is imminent in parts of Gaza. More than three quarters of the population have been forced from their homes and swathes of the territory are in ruins. To meet its minimum needs, aid agencies and UN officials say Gaza currently requires roughly 600 aid trucks a day. But a review of UN and Israel military data on aid shipments reveal a grim reality. Since the start of the war, an average of just around 100 trucks have entered Gaza daily, set out to trace the tortuous route that aid takes into Gaza in an effort to identify the choke points and reasons for supply delays. <laughs> Galvanised by reports and images of starving children, the international community has been pressuring Israel to facilitate the transfer of more aid into Gaza. Some officials have accused Israel of blocking humanitarian supplies to Gaza. Starvation is used as a weapon of war. Aid agencies say Israeli red tape is slowing the flow of trucks carrying food supplies. Before the aid shipments enter Gaza, they have to undergo a series of Israeli checks. And a shipment approved at one stage of the process can later be rejected, according to aid workers and UN officials involved in the aid effort. Aid that does make it to Gaza can get held up by Israeli army checkpoints. Israel says its inspections aren't the reason for any backlog. Israel says the delivery of aid once inside Gaza is the responsibility of the UN and humanitarian agencies. Israel has also accused Hamas of stealing aid. The war was triggered by a Hamas-led attack on communities in southern Israel on October 7th that killed 1,200 people and resulted in more than 250 being taken hostage, according to Israel. Since then, Israel's assault on Gaza has killed more than 31,000 people, according to Gaza health authorities. Now, speaking of aid, some hopeful news. It seems as UK's Defence Ministry said in a statement that Britain's Royal Air Force airdropped more than 10 tonnes of food supplies into Gaza for the first time in hopes to relieve the situation of famine. For more on this story, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the UK. Clifford? Yes, I'm Rabi. Footage released by the RAF showed military personnel loading crates of supplies into an A400 in aircraft in Jordan before it went on to airdrop them over Gaza. The ministry said UK personnel worked closely with the Royal Jordanian Air Force to plan and conduct the mission. 
and the egg consisted of water, rice, cooking oil, flour, tin goods and baby formula. Footage from the ministry also showed Singapore Air Force personnel at the operation. The latest aid operation follows earlier efforts by the UK being a humanitarian supplies into Gaza. Britain's foreign ministry said on March 20th that a 2,000 ton food aid package had entered Gaza. Back to you, Angradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the UK. Thanks again. Well, sudden tragedy has struck over in Pakistan as there was a report of a lethal vehicle collision that was deemed to be the work of suicide bombers. The explosion rendered multiple Chinese nationals dead, with China requesting the hunt for the perpetrators be sped up. Now moving over to northwest Pakistan, a suicide bomber rammed an explosive-laden car into a vehicle carrying Chinese workers on Tuesday, killing a total of six people. Five Chinese nationals working as construction workers and engineers on a dam project died, as well as their Pakistani driver in the attack in the district of Shangla. The five Chinese engineers were working on the Dasu Dam, Pakistan's biggest hydropower project. The attack comes less than a week after a vehicle carrying Chinese citizens came under fire from Baluchistan Liberation Army militants outside the Chinese-funded Gwadar port in the volatile southwestern Baluchistan province. Thousands of Chinese laborers work in Shangla as part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, an area of significant investment as part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. And still on China relations, as the event took place, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi held talks with Anarian Kaji Swesta, Nepal's Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister in Beijing, leading to a lot of discussion on the future of the relationship between the two nations. Wang, also a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China's Central Committee, said as a friendly neighbor of strategic partner, China has always placed Nepal in an important direction of the neighboring diplomacy. Wang said China is ready to work with Nepal to promote high-quality belt and road cooperation and advance the China-Nepal strategic partnership of cooperation featuring everlasting friendship for development and prosperity to a new and higher level. Shrestha said the new government of Nepal attaches great importance to relations with China. Nepal said it is willing to work with China to advance the belt and road cooperation and decided to join the group of friends of the Global Development Initiative. And now some updates on the Moscow massacre. Russia's top officials have directly accused the West and Ukraine of being involved in the deadly concert hall attack just outside of Moscow that killed over 100. While the Islamic State claimed it carried out the attack and released footage of the atrocity, Russian authorities said the jihadists were assisted by Western intelligence. Russian President Vladimir Putin said in a televised meeting on Monday that we want to know who ordered it while acknowledging radical Islamist movement in the attack. Following Putin's comments, Russia's Security Council Secretary Nikolai Patrushev on Tuesday, when asked whether the Islamic State or Ukraine was behind the attack, said, of course, Ukraine. The head of Russia's Federal Security Service, Alexander Bortnikov, also on Tuesday went further to say that while IS carried out the attack, it was obviously facilitated by Western Special Services, saying that Ukraine's Special Services had a direct connection to the attack. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky denied Ukraine's involvement, saying Putin was talking to himself again. Again, he blames Ukraine, a sick and cynical creature. Fifteen days before the attack, the U.S. had warned Moscow of an imminent extremist attack on Russia. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more key global stories. Stay right there. Welcome back. We're moving to updates in the U.S. now. The Baltimore Bridge collapse is seeing some unfortunate updates tonight. Authorities said the six road workers who were missing after a bridge collapsed in Baltimore Harbor are now presumed dead, pulling dive teams out of search and rescue operations since conditions in the dark waters had become much more risky.
State Police Colonel Roland Butler. The last thing we want to do is put divers in the water with changing currents, low temperatures, very poor visibility, and so much metal and other unknown objects in the water. All it takes is one object to strike an individual, and all of a sudden we have a first responder trying to recover another first responder. Eight workers were filling potholes on the Francis Scott Key Bridge around 1.30 a.m. local time when a massive cargo ship crippled by a power loss rammed into the structure. The workers and vehicles on the bridge plunged into the water as a trestled section of the 1.6-mile bridge crumpled into the Patapsco River. Two were pulled to safety, with one of them hospitalized. But some 18 hours after the accident, officials said there was no hope of finding the missing six alive in the icy water. Butler said authorities hoped to return divers to the water after sunrise on Wednesday to recover the workers' remains. He also did not rule out the chance that there may have been other vehicles on the bridge that fell in the water. As unfortunate as it may be, it's a distinct possibility. However, we don't have any information to support that at this point. Officials credited the crew of the Singapore-flagged container ship, named Dali, for averting a potentially much worse disaster. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said they reported the power failure before the impact, allowing officials to cut traffic off the bridge. Moore said the Dali crew saved lives and called them heroes. The ship's manager said all 22 members were accounted for and uninjured. Authorities say the bridge was up to code and suspect no foul play. But the accident has forced the closure of one of the busiest ports on the U.S. eastern seaboard. I've directed my team to move heaven and earth to reopen the port. And President Joe Biden has pledged full federal support in response to the emergency. Now, just yesterday, we were covering Trump's legal troubles. Well, clearly, the former president's luck is on some form of roller coaster, as his media company, Trump Media and Technology Group, enjoyed a stellar stock market debut. By day's end, the firm behind the Truth Social Network was valued at close to eight billion U.S. dollars. Analysts say that's an extraordinary number for a company that reported barely more than three million in revenue over the first nine months of last year. The debut may be a timely boost for Trump. He's been struggling to raise money for his campaign and legal expenses as he faces four criminal cases. Now his stake in TMTG is worth around $6 billion, though lockup rules bar him from selling the stock or borrowing against it for six months. As for Truth Social, it gets a $300 million cash injection as part of the deal. But Vespula Capital founder Jeff Tomasulo says it remains hard to justify the lofty valuation put on its parent firm, a tiny fraction of the number on X. That may not matter much for TMTG stock if it's really just a way to bet on Donald Trump's future success. And on the road to the White House tonight, it seems all candidates are rushing to plead their case to their voters. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris promoted their health care agenda in the background state of North Carolina, arguing that Democrats like themselves would preserve access to care while Republicans would reverse gains made over the past decade and a half. Meanwhile, independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has chosen Nicole Shanahan as his running mate in the upcoming coming elections. Shanahan hails from California and is recognized as a lawyer and philanthropist primarily in Silicon Valley. She is the founder of BIECO Foundation, a philanthropic organization that supports causes such as women's reproductive science, criminal justice reform and environmental initiatives. Amaralis Fox Kennedy, the campaign manager and Kennedy's daughter-in-law, commended Shanahan's dedication to critical issues such as racial equality, regenerative agriculture and mental health. Meanwhile, the Biden-Harris camp continued to speak their supporters in North Carolina. Fourteen years after the President Barack Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law, the White House still sees the health care as a winning issue during a campaign in which Biden has sometimes found himself on the defensive when it comes to our immigration or the economy. Republicans have opposed Biden's signature initiatives to a lower medical cost as they've seized opportunities to restrict abortion rights after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade.
And now an update on the doctor walkouts in South Korea. A few hours ago, Korea's biggest doctor group elected a new leader, but one who is against the government's plan to increase medical school enrollment quotas. Meanwhile, President Yoon suk yeol proposes discussing next year's medical budget with the medical community, while Prime Minister Han duk su suggests creating a negotiating body with the doctors. The Korean government has once again made it clear that it will stick to its original plan to increase the medical school enrollment quota. As of March 20th, we finalized the expansion of the country's medical school quota by 2,000 for the 2025 academic year, along with sorting out allocations for each school. We're moving ahead smoothly with the next steps, such as incorporating these changes into university admissions. The government will complete follow-up measures by May. Minol on Tuesday, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol visited a general hospital in Cheongju, Chungcheongbuk-do province and proposed that the medical field discuss the health care budget for next year. Prime Minister Han dok su also met with medical school leaders to propose dialogue between medical sector stakeholders. Also, to facilitate talks, the government has postponed the suspension of doctors' licenses who have walked out in protest. The government will find flexible solutions for the administrative measures regarding the departure of trainee doctors from the medical field in order to minimize the medical service disruption. The exodus of medical school professors nationwide continues. To show their solidarity with trainee doctors, on Monday, most of the country's 40 medical school professors submitted resignation letters, including almost 430 at Ulsan University and around 400 at Seoul National University. Unless the government withdraws its plan to increase the medical school quota and allocation, this crisis cannot be resolved. We are ready to discuss all pending issues in front of the public. But I don't believe withdrawing the plan equals to eliminating the expansion entirely. Amidst the confusion, a pediatrician Im hyun Tech was elected on Tuesday evening as the new leader of the Korean Medical Association. However, there is speculation that may push for an even larger scale walkout because the newly elected individual has voiced opposition to the government's plan. To minimize disruption to patient care, the government says it will deploy an additional 1,900 physician assistant nurses alongside the current 5,000 deployed. It seems some speculation went the wrong way on North Korea's end tonight. The country reaffirmed they had absolutely no interest in holding any talks with Japan like previously assumed, putting a strain on the already tightrope relations between the two nations. North Korea has said that it will not hold a bilateral summit with Japan. According to the regime's state-run news agency on Tuesday, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's powerful sister Kim Yo-jong stated that any offer of negotiations from Japan would be rejected. Kim Yo-jong said in a statement that Japan has no courage to change its history or to plan the next step between the two sides. She also said Japan has interfered by mentioning nuclear and missile issues. Kim Yo-jong recently said that Japan's prime minister has conveyed hopes for a summit, while Fumio Kishida answered that nothing has been decided. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more world news. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, with all the talk around mental health and therapy, we often hear of getting the assistance of another human to work through such uncomfortable times. Well, here comes a possibly far more enticing offer, healing time with some animal friends. Support comes in many forms at this farm in Australia. The Euroa Horse Park in Victoria offers animal-assisted learning and therapy. It says forging relationships with the animals help people gain better control and understanding of our words, emotions and actions. Carl McCowan was born with cerebral palsy and scoliosis. He survived a brain aneurysm four years ago. I'm going to come through the gates and I'm going to <sighs> relax. Animal-assisted therapy has been part of his recovery. And it does make you think you have to slow down um, 
they don't come up to your speed, you've got to go back to theirs and it does give you a whole new focus. And they become more aware of their body language, their communication um, and the trust and respect grow. Along with dogs and horses, Euroa has enlisted the calming presence of cows in its therapy services. Animal-assisted therapy has been embraced by some mental and physical health providers. There are a number of countries in Europe that already have uh, legislation in place that stipulates how many hours of training and that sort of thing. While many have seen successes with animal-assisted therapy, some say more evidence is needed. The field is really in its infancy and a lot more research is needed. And finally tonight, how far would you go for a glimpse of a good view? Most of us would be comfortable with climbing up a mountain or maybe a journey through the sea. Well, what about travelling to the fiery pits of a volcanic land? Here are the absolutely breathtaking visuals of such a place. Sightseers in Iceland got a two-for-one deal. A photographer captured the aurora borealis dancing over a volcano eruption. Both are phenomena that tourists flock to the small island nation to see every year. The volcano Grindavik has been spewing lava for months now, although officials say its flow is not as powerful as it was earlier in the year. More than 3,000 people who live in a nearby town evacuated in November out of an abundance of caution, which means they probably missed this site unless they came back for a visit. The best time to see the Northern Lights is during Iceland's winter, when days have limited sunlight. That lasts until about April, so visitors still have time to catch this nature show, as the volcano shows no signs it will stop erupting anytime soon. Well, personally, I think such a view is worth the perilous journey, but hey, we literally just got to experience the same view ourselves, albeit through a screen, but close enough, I'd say. Well, that's all the stories we've got for you on tonight's edition of World News. I'll see you again tomorrow with more stories from across the globe. Till then, good night.